This video is going to explore the work of Andrew Roberts uh, on the Napoleon case study, um, particularly focusing, I guess, a little bit on the influence in France and Europe debate, but also drawing very much on the extent of Napoleonic reform. He has a lot to say about both. So I'm linking this historian into both of those debates. Um, the basic logic here is that we're trying to develop a detailed uh, analysis, beginning a detailed analysis, not going to be exhaustive, but beginning to try to unpack this as a work of history and to explain how it comes to its particular conclusion and where it fits in the debate on these issues. So basically where this fits in is up here. So we've been looking at a range of different histories across the sweep of Napoleonic historiography. We looked at phase one of the work, uh, at the work of Emmanuel de las Casas. We looked here at Jules Barney. We looked here at Bonnie Smith and we looked here already at Boris Johnson and now we're going to add uh, Andrew Roberts into the mix because I think he's an interesting example of uh, new history essentially so or, or recent historiography so those two um, are interesting because for very different reasons um, they say a lot about what history looks like in the modern world so there you, you've got a, a total of five uh, sources that you can begin to think about in terms of this debate um, so what we're doing is trying to pick off some specific uh, historians and commentators along the way throughout that general sweep of time. Not trying to include way too many, okay, there's no way you can include all of the historians in each of these periods, but you need to be able to think about how many you might be able to actually include in the time you've got, but also depending on the question that you're being asked. So these I'm not suggesting are the only five you should necessarily use. Um, but I'm suggesting that they're a good place to start. And they also show you, I think, how you can begin to analyze historians in a little bit of detail. Um, so that detail is what we're trying to get here. Let's start by looking at Andrew Roberts's biographical details, just thinking about basically who he is so we understand um, this individual a little bit. Well, he's a British-born writer and public figure. So he is not necessarily a writer by his training or anything, but he has become a prominent writer just by the fact that he's done it and he's won a few awards and become quite prominent um, in that. He's also a public figure in that he's presented on TV and other things. So he, he is um, not necessarily famous, but he is relatively well known in uh, Britain. He actually studied history at Cambridge. I think he got a honours degree, which means he wrote a small thesis. Um, and he did quite well at that, okay? But that doesn't mean he's an academic historian uh, by any means. He's never worked, as far as I understand it, permanently at a university. So he's not necessarily someone who went through university, uh, was lodged into a faculty, and has worked there ever since. Um, but he is, uh, so he's quite different to someone like Bonnie Smith in that regard, who is an academic um, by training, by uh, work, and by um, ongoing employment. He is someone who's uh, taken a different path. He's work, actually worked in a variety of fields. I think his parents slash family were quite wealthy, so he uh, had a connection to businesses. Um, so he, uh, perhaps that explains, I don't know a lot about his um, personal life, but he was involved in investment banking, um, company directors. Uh, he was a company director. He's been a think tank scholar uh, at one point. He's been obviously a writer and also a television presenter. So he's done a range of things. He hasn't been an academic historian. He's also generally aligned with neoconservatism in Britain, which is basically your kind of moderate right-wing groups in Britain. Uh, so my, maybe like the Liberal Party in Australia or something like that, he's basically linked with that group of people, although his views on things are complex as well. I'm not trying to pigeonhole him. One of the things that he did come out and say, and I think this is part uh, an important part of Andrew Roberts' uh, biography, is that he has said a lot of controversial things, including some of the things that he says about Napoleon here. But one of the things he did was defend the US and the UK when they decided to take military action in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, so, for example, he, he defended the decision of George Bush um, and Tony Blair to invade Iraq after all of that had taken place. Um, he said that that was actually a, mod a rational course of action, and that was obviously uh, a hugely and hotly debated issue um, back in 2003. So he, he's happy to say controversial things. And controversial, uh, many controversial issues come up in this book that we're going to focus on, Napoleon the Great. So this is the book that we're, that we're focusing on which is recent book, I think published 2013 or 2014. Um, but the important point about this as well is not that it's just he's published a book, but the fact that this is in a sense become a mixed media argument where in a sense, 
uh, Roberts has actually delivered this thesis not just through the book but also through uh, a BBC series, a radio series and a debate um, with Adam Zamoyski for Intelligence Squared. So in a sense this is kind of mixed media history, reflective perhaps of how history can be uh, communicated in the modern age. It's not just books and lectures, this is you know, a whole variety of media now open to people because of essentially technology. Uh, so if you're asked to write about technology, then maybe this is actually something you could bring up. That is part of how the debate has begun to um, perhaps change in the modern world. In terms of the context of this book and these inter the, the interpretation, um, a couple of things. Certainly it fits clearly within this period that Daniel Wolf discusses called the fragmentation of history. And we've seen, we've talked about this a number of times in the other, other videos, but what we're talking about here is a huge expansion of the voices involved in these debates. Um, so that's part of what's going on. He's an example of this, Andrew Roberts, because he's not a, an academic historian, but he is a very influential figure in the debate about Napoleon. So this is suggesting that the history has been opened up in all sorts of different ways. Um, there's also the problem that we've talked about in relation to Boris Johnson and other issues, but the crisis of historical author authority, that historians are no longer seen as the guardians of the past. And that has meant, and connected to this fragmentation and democratization of history, that, uh, that historical authority no longer belongs to one group. And perhaps it never did, but it certainly, uh, the historian, the professional historian certainly had quite a lot of influence throughout the 17th, 18th centuries. But in the 20th century, this began to unravel. And it's clear now in the 21st that it, it, it is, um, their, their position is one, as I've said a number of times, as a fellow traveler um, in terms of understanding the past. Probably the, the single most important piece of context, though, um, in terms of history for, for Andrew Roberts is the bicentenary of Waterloo, which took place in 2015. So that's a 200 year anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo, which basically ended Napoleonic reign. And the anniversaries, centenaries, bicentenaries, all of these things are going to make debates prominent in society um, again. Okay, so the debate we will see on Napoleon or have seen on Napoleon has never been far from the surface of British and European history and so on. But certainly when uh, an anniversary of some kind comes around, the debate tends to flare up very uh, publicly, as say we've seen in Australia with the centenary of the First World War and Anzac and so on. Okay, So the bicentenary uh, of Waterloo um, did a, a number of things and really it raised a couple of questions that have always been there but it brought them right back to the surface and there's this intense kind of scrutiny. You saw lots of articles being published in magazines and so on trying to grapple with this and, and you got books, many books being published and so on. How is Napoleon to be remembered? This is part of the big bicentenary. How are we going to represent that time? Do we represent it as positive or negative or something else? Um, what was his legacy? Was it uh, a reforming legacy? Was it an imperial legacy? Was it some kind of complex mix of the two? How are we going to actually remember Napoleon is the big issue around the bicentenary. Now, Andrew Roberts is weighing in on those questions with this book. Uh, it's interesting to note, just to just point this out, uh, this is a review by um, of, of Napoleon the Great by uh, another historian, Mark Mazower, who's a very well-known scholar of uh, 20th century Europe, um, but Europe in general actually now, and, and big theme, big political theme. So he's certainly well positioned to discuss this. Now, he actually takes a very favorable view of the book, but some of the comments he makes in this review in The Guardian from uh, 2014 are actually uh, interesting just in and of themselves. This question, what sort of Napoleon does our generation want? This seems to be uh, an interesting question because he's not saying what sort of Napoleon does the historical record require. He's asking this question of how we in the 21st century are going to remember Napoleon depending on our present needs. Very constructionist, relativist kind of approach to history there. So he, he's raising an interesting question about this and certainly interprets the book very favorably. He also says, and I think this is one of the most important comments in the article, he says that the man and his times, that is Napoleon, are very much in fashion right now. And we are living through something of a new golden age of Napoleonic literature. And he places this book by Andrew Roberts firmly at the center of that. He says this is perhaps one of the greatest examples of good scholarship about Napoleon in this new golden age. So the debate has never died away. Uh, perhaps Peter Guile got it right when he said this is a debate without end, uh, and for, in, in fact, it might actually be a debate that never ends. Okay, so this is part of the argument. We're very much living in a time where Napoleon is a fashionable topic, partly because I think of the bicentenary.
Also, I think it's partly got to do with big issues in Europe, Euroscepticism returning to the surface very much in the last few years, and certainly this year with the Brexit campaign where Britain voted by a narrow margin to leave the European, um, uh, the European Union. And the point here is that it's raised issues. What is Europe? Um, is it something, and how should it be organized? Is it something that should be integrated under the umbrella of a big organization like the European Union? Or is it something that should actually be fragmented and all over the place, each country to its own? This is a big question. Now, obviously, people like Boris Johnson, Johnson think that the idea of Europe is really problematic, but there are others who think it can be quite workable. Um, now, why, why people have obviously thought of Napoleon here is because he did, to some degree, in, in integrate Europe. Now, he did it to some degree, again, by force, but he did create an empire that covered a large, large part of the continent. And for the people who think that was positive, they sort of point that out to be a kind of a peaceful period after the wars, okay, and an era of progressive reform. So there's arguments in favor of that, that integrating Europe can be done and it can be done well. And there is arguments obviously against it. So Napoleon sits as part of that discussion as well, not just the bicentenary, but those other contemporary concerns. So what are um, Roberts's aims and purposes in this in creating this work, there's a few things I think that are important to point out. He claims in the introduction that a big part of his purpose is to navigate what he calls the labyrinth of interpretation. So think of that as the this complex web of interpretations and the avalanche of information. That he is recognizing that Napoleon has been written about millions of times, thousands of times perhaps. And he's suggesting that what he's trying to do is cut through that and say something clear based upon the empirical record that he has available to him. So he's not, he suggests, he's trying to, or well, this is his claim, I've tried to not be overly influenced by previous interpretations, by getting tangled up in this labyrinth, but by cutting through it. Okay, but to go back, he said, so far as possible to Napoleon's own words, and here being own dependable words, he's, he's critical of Napoleon, and he's, you know, uh, does his, the work of a historian in uh, testing his sources, and the words of those who knew him personally. So he's tried to go back to the empirical record, that's his argument. He also aims, I think, to, declaim, uh, to defend the claim that Napoleon was actually great. He deserves the title great. And he does this, though, on the basis of the empirical record. That's his claim. So he's aiming to check the documents, go to the battlefields, do um, you know, good, proper, thorough history. But in the introduction, he suggests at the end of the introduction that he says, I hope by the end of this book that you will agree with me that Napoleon was truly great. So he's out to push that line of argument. Okay, So that's part of it. He's defending this claim. And also I think this is a, an important part of his work. And that is that this is a biography. Remember this is a biography of Napoleon, which is different to all of the books we've looked at so far. You've got the memoir from De Las Casas, essentially a, men, a memoir. You've got the lecture series by Jules Barney. You've got the... Um, the work of feminist history by bon Bonnie Smith, which is not a biography, it's a, it's a more wide-reaching history. And you have the kind of populist comments of Boris Johnson. So this is different, again, because it's a different form of history, partly. And part of the aim in most biographies is to develop an engaging story of the subject, an engaging narrative. And he's done that very much here. In fact, many people have celebrated this book, regardless of whether they agree with it, for the um, fluency for the structure, for the flow of the narrative, it's a really engaging story that he has built up. It's also not overly dense on technicalities. Now, it's it's certainly dense in terms of detail. That's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at here is he doesn't go off on tangents and discuss incredibly um, complex, convoluted issues like, say, the European econ economic system. Now, he talks about it, but he doesn't necessarily go into some detailed... Uh, analysis of that that you might expect from say an academic PhD thesis or something. He actually is trying to um, stay uh, fast in terms of the narrative rather than getting bogged down in all sorts of things that might, uh, uh, and you might say an average reader might find a little bit too over their head. He's trying to stay focused on the narrative and only touch on those issues where he really has to to explain something. So that's part of the, the purpose as well is to deliver an engaging narrative. Now, not everyone's out to do that, okay? Obviously, um, Jules Barney wasn't out to do that. Uh, obviously, Boris Johnson is not out to do that. And, you know, the, the, the aims and purposes here distinguish this work from others. How has he constructed his, his history? 
Well, he claims, and it's pretty clear that it is, based on extensive archival and field research. So the 33,000 letters that were released, um, not too recently actually, um, uh, they or very recently I should say, they were released and he's said that they are actually the bedrock of his interpretation. Now what he means by that I think is that he's not relying on it for everything, but that he, uh, in a sense, the, the uniqueness of this biography, because there are many biographies, is that it has brought to life this new material. Part of what he also has done is visited 53 of the 60 battlefields of the Napoleonic era, and he's tried to essentially do some sort of forensic historical analysis there to, to sort of check the story, check the, the documents against the terrain, and so on. So he's doing the work of a, you know, a thorough, thorough work of a historian here by testing his sources and trying to gain as much insight as he possibly can. He's focusing to some degree on military events, but not exclusively. So these issues are, in a sense, part of the focus of the work. But they are certainly not the exclusive focus. In fact, the general narrative is probably the most important thing here. As I've said, it's a popular, uh, it's a biography written for a popular audience. So this is not a, a book meant to be re read by academics primarily. There is incredible attention to detail. Some of the nuances and subtleties you discuss in the book are just very minute and in a sense give the impression that he is very in command of the sources. He knows where to draw on particular letters that were quite obscure to highlight issues in Napoleon's relationships and so on. Um, but he also interprets. There's no, there's no hiding this, that uh, Andrew Roberts is not just strictly presenting facts, he is also interpreting those based upon what he thinks is reasonable. So in a sense you could see this as quite von Runckian. Von Runke always uh, said that sources and evidence needed to take the primary role in the construction of history, but that historians, once they were certain that the you know facts were verified and so on, they could begin to draw links between them very cautiously and very carefully and very scientifically, but nonetheless they could do that. I think Andrew Roberts is kind of approaching this in, in a similar fashion, or at least that's how he's tried to set it up. Lead with the sources, but then it's okay once things are verified to interpret. So that's uh, another key element, I think, of the construction here. But also, remember the argument is packaged in mixed media. So we are focusing perhaps on the book, but it's relevant to draw in the fact that the arguments have been um, encapsulated in a documentary, a radio series, and that public debate with Adam Zamoyski for Intelligence Squared. So it's not, in a sense, the construction of this history is not, uh, so partly this, this points out that it's definitely for a popular audience. Okay, you don't make documentaries for, uh, you know, exclusive PhD discussion circles, that tends not to be the case. Radio series, they tend to be for a very public audience and this debate was certainly held in a public location and broadcast and preserved on YouTube for the purposes of uh, mass dissemination. So this, I think Andrew Roberts has this wide audience in mind um, and that's why I suggested it's part of his aims and purposes to, is to not necessarily you know, um, bow down to those people and do whatever they want, but he is writing with them, I think, in, gen in, in mind. So what does he say? What's his interpretation actually conclude? That's part of his approach. Um, what does he actually say? Well, he says Napoleonic rule was overwhelmingly positive for France and Europe. That's his big conclusion in this debate. What he suggests is that it ended, some of the, the specific claims, that, this, that it ended instability and violence of the previous revolutionary regime. So he says it brought to an end the terror and it rationalized that chaotic period. Um, he also suggests that he actually carried forward the best elements of the Enlightenment and the Revolution. So not, not just that he rationalized it, but he also then, in a sense, sifted out the most important things like egalitarianism, tolerance, and rational secular government. Okay. Um, and took those into um, his future government. So that sense that he preserved and perhaps in a sense kind of um, made, uh, guaranteed the survival of the, of the most important ideas of the French Revolution really is the argument there. And in the process, uh, Roberts claims that he essentially laid the foundation for modern France but also modern Europe and even the basic idea of the West. Okay, So a couple of other things that are important is that he claims that, in addition to this, that Napoleon brought progressive change to Europe. So he discusses, for example, many of the conquered territories and he analyzes how they experienced Napoleonic rule. 
One example here that, that would be, I think, important is the discussion of Malta, right? So the small island um, that's part of Europe. And he suggests that Napoleon, in when he conquered Malta, abolished slavery, he abolished titles to nobility, okay, so the old ancient regime starting to disappear. He also introduced tax reform that, to make it more egalitarian, and he introduced street lighting and pavement. Now, what the picture you're supposed to be getting from this is that Napoleonic change ushered in uh, basically transformation from the highest, most abstract levels of society, slavery, nobilities and so on, right down to the very specific day-to-day -day infrastructural things, street lighting and pavement. So this is starting to get this sense that the extent of Napoleonic reform is incredibly broad. Napoleonic reform touched all areas of life, is, is part of the argument here. So um, it's also important to point out here though, you, you might be getting the impression that this is just in a sense a romantic kind of biography of Napoleon where um, Roberts is saying, picking out all of the, the good bits of his story and that's about it. It's not a hagiography. I think that's important. He says that explicitly, but it's also, I think, a fairly legitimate claim. Okay, A hagiography is quite uncritical. That's its basic kind of approach. Whereas, so Lacassus might fit that general description, but Andrew Roberts actually includes a lot of critical discussion of Napoleon. So he talks about his weaknesses. He talks about problematic cases. And a couple of good examples here are this. He, he accepts, for example, and points out and discusses that Napoleon actually reintroduced slavery in some of the French colonies in 1802. So there's a limitation to his reform, and there's also a limitation to how good we can claim Napoleon actually was. Right? He's not claiming Napoleon was perfect. He also uh, discusses many of the executions, the problematic executions of political opponents. One of them, this uh, particular individual who Chateaubriand uh, claimed was... Uh, very, very much um, unfairly treated by Napoleon and was emblematic of Napoleon's wickedness to a degree. Andrew Roberts agrees with that and says that his assassination, and I can never pronounce his name properly, but his assassination was totally unjustified, unfair, and but also uncharacteristic of how Napoleon tended to behave most of the time. So he accepts it, but he doesn't necessarily therefore transition and say Napoleon was terrible. Also, he's willing to accept that Napoleonic wars were insanely costly. Three million soldiers' lives and a million civilians at least. Right? So four million people at a time when populations were much smaller than they are today is incredibly costly. And he argues and accepts that many, or some at least, of these uh, deaths were unnecessary. That is, some of the campaigns Napoleon, Napoleon fought were not actually clever. So not everything he did was perfect. He thinks he was a great military commander, but he did make mistakes, and those mistakes sometimes cost the lives of a lot of soldiers. So he's critical of those things, and I think that's important to point out. A couple of quick quotes to give some sense of the flavor of this as well. He claims, Andrew Roberts claims, that Napoleon's civil achievements equaled his military ones and far outlasted them. This idea that his reforming change was profound and long-lasting. Uh, Napoleon was the last and greatest of the enlightened authoritarians of 18th century Europe who had begun to introduce rationalism to government and improve, improvement to the lives of their subjects. So he stands as the greatest reforming figure, perhaps, of the 18th century. Okay, Enlightened authoritarians, emperors who also had the best interests of the people at heart in terms of these progressive ideals. This is probably the most telling quote, I think, to some degree of the book. And... Uh, in terms of the relevance for this debate anyway. He says that during his 16 years in power, many of the best ideas that underpin and actuate modern democratic politics, such as meritocracy, equality before the law, property rights, religious toleration, secular education, sound finances, efficient administration, and so on, were rescued from the revolutionary maelstrom or chaos and protected, codified, and consolidated. So that idea that his impact was essentially to preserve the best things of the French Revolution and carry them forward with reforming zeal or enthusiasm, right? So this is the nutshell, I guess, of, of Roberts's interpretation, I think, is that quote for me. Fundamentally, in terms of an evaluation, fund he's fundamentally critical of any of the, not any, but most of the attacks on Napoleon, particularly by um, the memoirists, people like Chateaubriand, he has very little time for their crit critiques. He says that they're basically uh, opinionated polemics and that they don't really deal with history. They just deal with their emotional view on the topic. 
He's critical and would be critical of Jules Barney and Bonnie Smith. Now that's not saying he doesn't agree with some things some of those authors might say. For example, we've already pointed out that he agrees with Chateaubriand on the execution of certain people was unnecessary. But he doesn't agree with their overall conclusions. Okay, So he's not necessarily saying they're completely wrong, but he's saying that they have the interpretation is uh, not fair, the, the final interpretation. I think this is also a history that resists simple categorization. It's, it's certainly got academic qualities, absolutely, but also very popular qualities. So how do you kind of categorize it? It might be difficult. And it's probably a good example of one of those histories that resists that, pol uh, that categorization into one or the other. Is it an academic history or a popular, his popular history? Well, it's got elements of both. And that probably resists this idea that we need to see popular history as necessarily dangerous or, or not rigorous. And also the idea that any academic history has to be boring and stale. Um, this is part of the, uh, I think, the positive, uh, positive things that have come out of this debate about academic and popular history is that both popular writers and historians are, in a sense, trying to borrow from each other. And they clearly are succeeding at that in many ways. And part of the evidence of that is the mixed media approach here, that this is a book with rigorous footnotes and evidence, but it's also a documentary, it's also a radio series, and it also turned into a debate, right? So Roberts is not confined to a medium, and that's partly because he's a popular writer. I think it's also great evidence that polarized interpretations of Napoleon uh, still exist. So Guile, I think, was absolutely correct in pointing out that this Napoleon debate is, or at least in his view, has been up until his time, a, an argument without end. Well, I think I'd have no hesitation in suggesting that that's the case now as well. So there's a lot to be said for that. Just a quick, in a sense, anecdotal point, uh, point about this. A couple of newspapers that reviewed both the book and also the documentary series from Andrew Roberts show that that's how many people still read it. So for example, James Dellingpole at The Spectator, a kind of conservative magazine in June 2015, wrote that Andrew has gone on to do quite well for himself, so he knows Andrew Roberts personally. Most recently with his general accla acclaimed biography, Napoleon the Great, Roberts' thesis is that far from being an almost hit Hitler-like dictator, so challenging that interpretation of the black legend, his view is that Napoleon was actually, in fact, utterly fabulous and we should all admire him as much as Roberts has done since the age of 10. His new three-part series, I think this is important, is part of his re this rehabilitation exercise. This is a fairly glowing interpretation of the book, actually. The entire review here by Delling Pohl suggests that this is a great work of history and that it's pretty much very sound. Much the same as Mark Mazower's review suggests that he thinks it's actually, it's actually the best interpretation of Napoleon in recent years. On the other hand, uh, in The Telegraph, Gerard O'Donovan, so again, because this is a highly public publication, the public is engaging through you know, these forms of media, he suggests that when he saw the second episode of the, the BBC series, he said there was no getting away from Robert's regular lapses into hero worship. So hardly being objective and empirical, this is someone who's obviously got some romantic ideal about uh, how great Napoleon was and he's out to prove it. Surely the best way to give a rounded portrait of any man is to acknowledge his flaws rather than blame everyone else. So he's picking up on Roberts's tendency to argue that idea that Napoleon was forced to defend himself in a series of wars because the old regimes of England and Russia and Austria and so on were basically out to get him. So uh, there's two obvious reactions to this book that are very different and reflect the fact that in British society, at least, if not across European, the European world, that Napoleon is still very divisive indeed. Okay, where is this relevant to the debates? I, I think this is actually quite obvious what you can argue in terms of the conclusions that, that Roberts is drawing. And that is in terms of the impact on France and Europe, he's obviously suggesting that Napoleon's legacy was fundamentally positive. Okay, It's not a hagiographic claim, but it's a fundamental positive uh, contribution that Napoleon made to the history and development of Europe for all sorts of reasons, imperfect but fundamentally good. In terms of the extent of Napoleonic reform, the, there's an intimate link here. Again, he suggests the, reform, the reforming program of Napoleon wasn't perfect, nor was it entirely consistent. He did reintroduce slavery in parts of the French colonies, he suggests. 
Um, but generally, it's an expansive program that it touches, you know, the abolition of slavery and titles all the way down to the um, development and funding of pavement in different cities around the world, okay, for drainage and, and uh, transport. So this essentially is overwhelmingly positive in his view. The reform was far, far reaching and thorough that it also, in that sense, laid the foundation for Europe and the modern West. So this is quite glowing without being over the top, um, nauseating in terms of being hagiographic or anything like that. So I think Andrew Roberts is a great example of a piece of recent historiography that's complex and also allows you to highlight many of the themes about history uh, in the 21st century.